Okay, so I feel like this is one of those people that reminds me that social media can be awesome. Yes. <laughs> I have such a love hate as to you today with social media, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the loves that I have is that I randomly get introduced to awesome people and then get to connect with them even more, right? And like through this platform, for example. Mm -hmm. So I'm so excited that you're here, Imani. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit? We always kind of start with, we're just curious, like what was the path that got you to be who you are, right? Like how are you standing here in this moment with us right now? <laughs> what did that journey look like? <laughs> well, I, I think for, for so many of us as therapists, um, we kind of come into this work because there may be parts of us that are a little codependent. I know for me. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> We love you already. <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, yeah that's enough. We got this. You know, I'm like, you know, like literally the, the typical thing you hear is like, oh, I just like helping people and I just uh -huh. like giving and like all this other stuff. So, so I think that that's a part of what got me into this work. But I remember when I was younger um, and even going into my undergrad, I went to school for elementary education because I thought that I wanted to be a teacher. Mm -hmm. Then I started doing student teaching and I was like, I hate this. I was like, I don't want to do these lesson plans. I don't want to be around these kids all day long. Like, no. That's so real. I, just, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh, this, this is not it. Like this was, this was good for me when I was doing like volunteer work when I was a teenager. But now like as my career, hell no. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I literally, um, I had, I had to really take some time and really figure out what my path was. I remember crying to my mom while I was in school, telling her it was my you know, third year in college. And I realized I didn't want to be a, a teacher anymore. And so mm -hmm. she told me, she's like, look, just, just get a degree. Like whether you change your major or not, just, just get the degree, finish your four years out. Um, and really just take the time to learn about yourself. Um, mm -hmm. one of the things that I, I really stress to a lot of people, especially younger people that are still in high school and stuff like that. It's like, there's no way that you're going to know what it is that you want to do when you're 18. Like, it's so unrealistic. It's so mm -hmm. ridi it's, it's ridiculous that that's even a thing. Um, but so much are, we, we're put in that situation. And so also bless yeah. your mom, by yeah. the way, for being like that, oh, because mother, really? I know, because like the number of same thing, like when I was working with a lot of teens during my my training, I remember so many times being like, your mom is not going to like this that I'm about to tell you this. But it doesn't give, I don't give one shit. It does exactly. not matter what you go to undergrad for. Like, unless you're like, I want to be a doctor. That's what I know in my gut. And so you go for it, which is like the very, very small percentage of humans, right? Exactly. It doesn't matter. I always say, I'm like, go get a professional ass wiping degree. It's not even about that. It's about <laughs> just getting to know yourself. So I'm so glad to hear that you had a mother yeah. that said that, embrace that. Yeah. Yeah. So I really took the time after that, after I graduated. I took about a year to really just figure out what it is that I wanted to do. I started following um, the holistic psychologists online. I started following mm -hmm. just different relationship coaches. And I was like, oh, like, why don't I just be a therapist? And, and I mm -hmm. realized through that work, through going through the school and everything, I'm like, I think my purpose was always to teach, but maybe just not in the capacity of like in school with children, but like right. to teach people about attachment trauma and relational trauma and trauma bonds and, you know, all these different things. Because even within that time, I was going through my own plethora of childhood trauma that was coming to the surface, specifically in my romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. And it took me going through a really traumatic situation about three, four years ago. Um, the guy that I was dating he cheated on me. But then he started like dating this girl that I was kind of like familiar with. Then about a year later, he got her pregnant. It was just like, it, it, it was just insane. So I, so I really hit this. Yeah. I really hit like this rock bottom and I was immediately like met with all of my insecurities, all of mm -hmm. my, my vulnerable, my abandonment wounds, like all of that stuff. And so I realized, you know, as I started doing that work and I was still doing my schooling, my, my, my graduate work and stuff like that too. But I realized I was like, you know what? I think I'm so much more than just a licensed marriage and family therapist. I think I'm more so, I, I tap into my spiritual gifts of being an intuitive. I also like to bring my authenticity to the table in regards to things that I've gone through. And, and I think for so many of us, we're stripped of our authenticity when we're in school learning how to be therapists. They tell Ooh. you what to say, <laughs> what to do, who you should be, like what you should share, what you shouldn't share. And I think that takes the, the humanity out of the experience to be able to like connect with another human being and say, hey, I've gone through the same thing you've gone through, or hey, I haven't gone through that, but I can still empathize with you. I can 
you know, teach you some tools in regards to being able to regulate. And so that's a little bit of what just, what just mm. got me here. Oh my gosh. I love it. Money so much. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, I, both Vanessa and I were excited and interested to hear and read about you being an intuitive. And I think this is something I convers this is a conversation that we have a lot about, um, some of the boundaries and the requirements that the licensure process puts us in as healers and people attempting to hold space for others in a way that feels authentic to us. Right. Um, and I, I just love to hear more about how you've navigated that and sort mm -hmm. of weaved those two elements of yourself into the work. Yeah. So I, I think for me, a lot of what I learned to do, I, I grew up in a very religious community when I was younger. So that comes with its own mm -hmm perform a playground of performance i would say so I, I was, <laughs> yeah exactly I, I was taught to literally just hide so many different parts of myself because you want to be obedient you want to be good you know all these different things and so when i was really in my schooling for therapy and i was like wait i'm, I'm kind of like being re-traumatized all over mm. again with like mm. being told what to do being told what to say and all these different things and i remember when I first started my Instagram page two years ago, I spoke to a marketing specialist and I was just telling her my situation. Like, I'm still in school. I don't have a license. I don't want other licensed therapists to come to me. I'm like, why are you talking about this stuff? Yeah. You know, report you to the board. Like, they always try to like threaten you with that stuff. Whatever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember her telling me, she was like, you know, I think it's really best for you to just start where you are now. So she's like, even if you're offering something like coaching, like that's not really something that you have to have a, a necessarily a, a license for, but you have the schooling and you have the education because you're in school for it. So she was like, literally show parts of your authenticity in that. And so that's mm -hmm. when I started doing coaching while I was in school. Um, and so I think it made it a little bit easier for me to show up more authentically there because I felt mm -hmm. like there weren't really any limitations, like really any, any boundaries. Like granted, I couldn't be diagnosing people and stuff like that, but I can really meet them from where they are and really focus on kind of like the presenting issue and just being able to, to move them forward. And so that's when I started to get a little bit comfortable of like, Hey, I have this spiritual gift that I also use. And mm -hmm. if my clients resonate with that, they resonate that with, with that. If they don't, they don't. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was really just me using a lot of the insecurities that I had, the shame and the guilt that I was holding about these parts of myself and really coming into loving those parts of myself on my own. God, yeah. How old are you? <laughs> 28. Like, like, Girl. This crazy old soul in this video. Like, this woman. That's amazing. Um, yeah. I want to circle back to the playground of performance yeah. that you talked yeah. about in religious circles because I had such a like, whoa. And I think um, certainly I'm assuming you grew up in the black church in yes. New York. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what that was like in that experience, because I think that that is also, um, you know, we talk about like. God, just like still like the stigma around mental health and, you know, like people being crazy and all you mm -hmm. need is God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All you do, all you have to do is just pray about it. And then like all your problems are just going to like magically go away, yeah. you know? Um, and so I know for me growing up in that community, that's the thing. It was a community. There were mm -hmm. a lot of people there who encouraged me, a lot of people there who helped me grow. But then at the same time, there were a lot of people there who hurt me. There were a lot of things that were said that were really hurtful. I remember maybe around the age of like five or six, the pastor was like preaching this message and, you know, they're, they're like really, really into it, like the yelling and the screaming and stuff like that. And it was one of those like fire and brimstone messages, <laughs> like mm -hmm. you're going to go to hell, like mm -hmm. if you're not obedient and stuff like that. And, and I think about that stuff now and I'm like, I'm looking back at that, like the, the younger version of myself hearing something like that. And I already, my heart is broken for her Yes, because you, yes. You're, you're literally just like, wow. So like, I, I can't really be myself or like, I have to do this and I have to do these things because if I don't, I'm not going to get heaven's reward and I'm just going to burn up. And it's just like, mm -hmm. so it's, so it's, it's a lot of like these, these fear tactics a lot to like get you to be someone that you're not, um, and even through my own individual work, I've learned to even show compassion 
for the people who said certain things like that to me, have, have hurt me in, in, in that environment, because they were only going off of what it is that they were taught. So they're thinking that I'm, I'm actually sharing information with you that is loving, you know, mm-hmm. that's going to get you to heaven. Um, and it's and it's really not. And so I just remember being in church. My mom had me a part of the choir. She had me a part of the usher board. She had me in abstinence program. She had me in. They also had like an entrepreneur program, which was really cool. So it's, it's like this mix of like really, really good things. And then like other things that I that I didn't really want to do. But my mom was like, well, you have to do it because that if you're in church, you can't just sit in the audience all day long. Like you have to participate. You have to give back. You have to you know, show God that you are giving and obedient, all these different things. And so it's a lot of these fear tactics, really psychologically, where you're kind of like, I I can't be my authentic self. And at the time, you don't even know, right? But it's Mm -hmm. like, I, I can't really be my authentic self. That's the message that you're getting, because my survival is going to be threatened. And not even just just here in this natural life. Forever and ever. Eternity. Ever. You're just going to burn up. And so I, I think I've, I've watched so many of my peers in that environment do things out of obligation, like get married at a really yes. early age, um, you know, become pastors at, at a very early age. Um, it, it, and it, it's a lot of like, you know, you haven't even really gone through any life experiences yet mm-hmm. to actually know if this is really what it is that you want to do or mm-hmm. you're just doing it because this entire community is pressuring you to do it. Um, So I watched a lot of my peers take that road. And then I also watched some of my peers step into their authenticity and then get shamed and chastised for it. Like homosexuality is something that is not tolerated. Um, Having sex before you're married, getting pregnant before you're married. Like, you know, a lot of times people wouldn't come back if those things happened because it was communicated to them that they wouldn't Mm -hmm. be accepted. And so growing up in that community definitely came with some gems. And it also came with some painful challenges. And I actually, it wasn't until actually recently, the beginning of the pandemic, where I felt like that was like, oh, this is like an escape. Mm. I don't have to go back anymore. Like, I, I didn't feel obligated because the world at that point was like, everything is shut down. Like, you can't go back. And so I kind of use that as a, like, almost as an escape. Like, okay, now I can, I can disconnect from this and actually develop my own relationship with God Mm. and, you know, see what it is that I want to do without feeling like this pressure from like other people. Um, And that's when I really started to just cultivate my own individual relationship with God. I started to really tap more into the gifts that he gave me because my mom is also, my mom calls it in, in, in black church, Christian culture, it's called, you have a prophetic gift. Mm -hmm. So you're able to prophesy over people's lives. Like I have dreams and all this stuff like that, that come true. Um, so my mom calls it a, pro- a prophetic gift, but I, I felt like I was able to use it more not being in that environment, which is which is so ironic for me. Wow. Um, so, yeah, that w- that's a little bit of my experience in that. I, I, I think I always kind of have this tug of war. It's kind of like leaving an abusive relationship in the beginning. It's like, yeah. oh, like, should I go back? But like, there were like, all the good all things, good, right? All these good things that they did. And like, I had people who came to my graduation and gave me money for my birthday. So, so, so you know, it, it's, it's a lot of love there, but there's also a lot of pain mm-hmm. there too. And so it's just, it's one of those things that's really confusing. And, and honestly, one of those things that I'm still working through because I, because I'm understanding like literally your entire identity was centered around this community. You didn't, you didn't really have any time to really explore who you were outside of that. I literally just started doing that two years ago. Mm. I'll tell you, I have like a visceral in my body response when you were talking about that little five-year-old version of yourself. And I was thinking if anybody ever tried to give my kid that kind of messaging, like I I felt it in my body, like just like my anger and my like wanting to protect that five-year-old version of yourself that's being told that your truest essence is not enough. And then if you don't do things like become obedient and do what I say that you're going to burn for all eternity. Like I just have such a, and I obviously not in the black church, but I grew up Methodist and I I have my own kind of experiences with that. My mom had a kid out of wedlock, my brother, and we got kind of, you know, ousted for that. And it was this whole thing. We ended up not going back. And so I just have a similar kind of like, oh, that feeling of like, I look at my precious little two and a half year old and I'm like, you are perfect. 
You are perfect exactly as you are, period. And don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise, you know? Yeah. 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 And and that's that's kind of like when I was doing a lot of just like inner child work around a lot of this, because a lot of what I experienced came from, you know, having to people please, and you know, like that fawning response and stuff like that mm-hmm. came from that environment and, and the fact that it's so normal. I, yeah. I remember being like around the age of 12 and 13 and I would have these conversations with certain people like, oh, like, you know, this doesn't really feel right. Like, I don't feel like we should just have to do this just because they're telling us we need to show up to this rehearsal and do this part of the Christmas play and do this for Easter. I'm like, I feel like we should, they should give us like options of what's authentic to us, what we want to do, how we want to serve in ministry. And I remember some people, multiple people telling me like, well, Imani, that's just the way it is. Like, we don't really question this stuff. And, you know, even if you were to bring it up to someone, it's not going to change anything. I remember a couple of years back, um, I got an email from my, well, former pastor. And he was like, I need you all in a, in a meeting. And we got to the meeting and he was like, you're going to be the new youth director. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And I'm like, I'm literally the only one at the table. Like, are we just being assigned roles? Mm-hmm. Mind you, none of this stuff is paid. You're, this is all, <laughs> this is all volunteer work. Right. And so, so I, I looked over to the girl next to me and I was like, do you like really want to, want to do this? She's like, I guess I don't really have a choice. And it, it, you mean, mm-hmm. I think, I think at that point, that's when it clicked for me. I was like, I have been brainwashed. Oh, mm. Not only have I been brainwashed, this person next to me has been brainwashed and probably every single person at this table has been brainwashed. The fact that it was it was almost it was almost like I was sitting at a table with zombies. I don't have and a everybody's choice. Everybody's just taking it. Right, everybody's just like taking it and no one's challenging it, asking any questions. It's like awkward silence and people just falling into this role of being this director. And um, you're not getting compensated or, or, or really anything like that. I think mm. even if you weren't getting compensated, because I do believe in volunteer work, um, but, I, but I think it really is something you have to be passionate about. I'm just like connecting <clears throat> so many dots in the story that you just told. I think, you know, Vanessa and I talk so much about how um, our earliest need is attachment and ultimately belonging is what that attachment is about. But or, But then we reach this point where we realize that we need to come into authenticity, right? And we need to be an autonomous self. But until we come to that point of realization, attachment will always trump authenticity Mm -hmm. because we needed it at some point for survival. And I'm just thinking about how much your experience with the church sort of mirrors what I believe we have been experiencing collectively over the last couple of years. And you know, that it almost like we had to be snatched away from sort of that patriarchal model model of like the father who rules above and tells you who you are meant to be and what you are meant to do for us to go inward and seek that Mm -hmm. inner authority to say, but what is my truth, right? And it's just fascinating how it's, I know you probably can speak to this better than I can, Money, but like the cosmos almost designed a Mm -hmm. situation where we were forced into this space of going inward. Shutting the external... Out, yeah, right? and not being able to go to church and be in the space of like the safety of our belonging, but that we had to be uncomfortable enough to say like, no, I got to stay with myself and figure out what's true. You know, exactly, exactly. And I, 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 so I have a membership where I talk about a little bit of my story there because I always tell people I'm like, Instagram is not a safe space. Mm. <laughs> you cannot say everything on Instagram. People mm. are going to attack you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I, um, I, I share a lot of my own personal experience in my membership and I was I was telling someone about how I really found I really developed more of a personal relationship with God than ever before mm-hmm. once the pandemic hit mm-hmm. once I was not in that in that environment where I felt like I had to alter myself and perform and it was one one night I was journaling um and it came to me in a message and and God pretty much said to me he was like Imani I had to do this to push you forward you know and like I couldn't do any work that I wanted to do in your life with you wearing this mask the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then I I was like, oh my God, oh my God. Mm -hmm. I was like, so I was like, so pretty much, it it, it kind of goes back to, um, if you you ever really read into the Bible and kind of like the Pharisees and and, and stuff like that, like the people who were like holier than thou. And and, and in that message, while I was journaling, he really communicated to me, like, I can't do the work that you want me to do in your life if you're showing up as a false version of yourself. None of these people are going to be able to get 
anything because they're not even creating that space inside of themselves for me. And I was like, I was like bawling, crying. It was like for like a whole hour. And I was like, I finally get it. You want mm. me to be myself. It's it's not about it's not about this whole like, oh, you're sinning and you're gonna you're gonna go to no. hell and you're gonna do that. But like I, I wanna meet you where you're at so I can give you the desires of your heart. You know, like let me do the work. You don't you don't need these other people to tell you who's right, who's wrong, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Let people, me people, by the way, operative words. Yes. Let tell these people that are telling right. you what's right, right and what's wrong. Right? Right. <laughs> Right, right. And and meanwhile, you know, I know one of the other things in the church, too, is like a lot of things get swept under the rug. So mm-hmm. once again, you have people performing, but then behind closed doors, they're cheating on their wife or they're <laughs> doing all, all these different things. And, and you could very well know these things and still no one will say no anything. No one talks about it. Yeah, the shadow. The shadow is strong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's definitely been a journey for me. Um, really just getting into that authenticity because even when I started my business, I was kind of like, okay, well, like, who, who should I be? <laughs> right? Like, like, yeah. who should I like try to be like? And, you know, what should my message say? And all these different things. And, and, and I really had to strip myself of following someone else's agenda because that's what I was, I was taught to do. So I, so I really had to work around that conditioning. How's your relationship with your mom since all of these kind of revelations and, and pivots, I suppose, in your life? I'm just curious. Yeah, me and my mom growing up, it was pretty rough. It was growing, it was pretty rough for us. I thought that my mom was out to like ruin my life. Um, my mom, she tends to have very controlling tendencies. My mom was very strict, very overprotective. She's a probation officer, so she works in the criminal justice system. My dad also is a parole officer, so he works in the criminal justice system. So hopefully that gives you an inkling of like what my childhood <laughs> was like. I wasn't allowed to go to sleepovers, no parties, you need to be home at like three o'clock after school, like all these different things. And so growing up, it was it was a little rough because I felt I always felt so misunderstood mm-hmm. by her. Um, and it was kind of like that same dynamic. Like sometimes she was able to kind of show up consistently and offer that nurturing. But then other times she was caught up in like her own world that she wasn't really able to offer me that that consistency. Um, So my relationship with my mom, especially in my teenage years, early 20s, very, very, very rough. I just couldn't understand her. Um, And it wasn't until I started doing some work two years ago where where I really learned to honor the strength in her survival tactics. Mm. so the the times that she told me to people please the times that I watched her bend over backwards for the church and you know she had she really struggled with this um like this inability to say no and I watched it time and time and time again I remember my mom there would be people at the church who didn't have a car and they lived like 30 45 minutes away from where we lived and they would ask her for a ride and she would give it to them and they would just hop out the car don't give her any gas money nothing like that it's just like oh thanks sis and so, so I watched my mom kind of like disown herself so many different times, but then complain to me, right? She would complain to me about it um, because I've, I've always been like this in a way. Like I've yeah. always been the one that's like, oh, I'll offer advice. I'll help. I'll tell you what it is that I think that you should do. Yeah. So it was very rocky in the beginning. It, it wasn't up until maybe about two years ago that I really started to just see her as human, like like outside of that role of like, you're my mom, so you should have done this. Mm-hmm. You're my mom, so you should have given me that. It's like strip her of all of that, see her as an imperfect human being, um, and and really just actually start to get to know her out, outside of you know just these expectations that you had of her growing up. Now that I'm no longer living with her, I'm, I'm on my own and stuff like that. My survival is really more so dependent on me, and and so I had to really do some work around being more honest with my mom. I still, I'm still actively doing some work around that, setting boundaries with her. Um, you know, just, just a lot more of being authentic, even with her. So so, so, so it was a lot of me also having to say, okay, like I'm actually not this person, but I'm more so this person. Um, and I, and take it or leave it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I appreciate my mom because even though sometimes there is some, there is some pushback, I think all in all, she understands the bigger picture. And Mm -hmm. I think now more recently within the past, I would say three months when I have certain conversations with her, it's almost like a mirror. 
Like, like she's able to see parts of herself that she's disowned in a lot of the work that I'm doing. I was literally having a conversation with her last night where she's like, she's like, I've been at the city of probation. I mean, the city of Queens for, um, you know, almost 30 years. And I've always wanted to have this for myself and do this for myself. And like now seeing you tap into your gifts, like, I think I need to quit my job. I'm like, you should do it. So so it's a beautiful exchange now where it's like, I've learned so much from her. Yes, we've gone through our challenges, but now she's also learning some stuff from me too. I just love your ability to speak to complexity and nuance, Imani, like whether you're talking about the church or you're speaking about your mother that, you know, so much of this is the programming that all of the people around us, the survival mechanisms that they incorporated within their own life. And if we yeah. can hold space for their humanity, and I think that's a lot of times, you know, understandably what we're missing and like our healing journey or whether like we're in therapy and it's like, my mother was a narcissist and I just <laughs> realized and it's like your mother was actually a human and was doing the best she can she could with the tools that she had. Now that's not excusing any of the ways that you didn't feel met or seen. It's just holding for the complexity of what it means to be a human being. And I think you really model that so beautifully. So thank you. Thank for that. you. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just did um, a session with a coach a couple of weeks ago and she was telling me, she's like, you know, your, your grandmother and your, your mom, but we were talking about um, just like my family of origin. She's like, they had to walk so that you could run, mm-hmm. you know? So like you look back at, you know, my, my grandmother, my mom's mom, she struggled with alcohol addiction Um, And so she died when I was, I believe I was two years old. So I don't really have like any memories of her or anything, but, uh, but a lot of the person that I am today, the things that trigger me today, like all these different things come from like generational trauma, like Mm -hmm. energy and like stuff that's been just passed down based off of the environments that we're in. And so instead of looking at, you know, how much the survival tactics have hurt us, we can, we can hold space for that. But then also look at what parts of this was actually just trying to protect me, you know, at the same time. And, and, it, and it goes back to what you said. It's kind of like, I think a lot of the times we have a difficult time trying to hold space for both. Mm-hmm. Acknowledging that there's some pain there, but then also acknowledging kind of what I mentioned before, the strength um, in those survival tactics and just doing whatever it is that you could in the given moment with the resources that you have. Yeah. I mean, isn't that like the, that's the the prescription for everything going on in our world right now, right? Is yeah. the ability to see the complexity and hold mm-hmm. the nuance of everything. I mean, when you realize that being a human is being complex and also being a human is this innate desire for things to be black and white, to fit into a box, to make sense, to check the boxes, whatever it is, right? And when you realize That's bullshit. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in nature. It doesn't exist, you know, as a human. Um, When I watch clients start to transition away from the black and white and start to move into the ability to say yes and, and the ability to say that hurt, but um, it is such a magical, amazing thing to behold, right? Because you just know I don't know. You like can see how that then ripples out to everything in their lives, right? All of their yeah. relationships, their work, their community, their parents. I mean, everything. Um, that ability. And it's not easy. I mean, listen, people who are listening, like this is a practice. You have mm-hmm. to continue to come back over and over again and remind yourself there's complexity here. It's not black and white. What's the fear that's trying to make me put things in a box, right? And really question that. But when you can do that, it can give you so much more freedom and so much more peace. Exactly. Exactly. And I think, you know, um, I I tell my members in my membership all the time, you know, when you think about any of your coping mechanisms, your, your survival tactics and stuff like that, there is some part of that that is giving you some sense of comfort. Even Mm -hmm. if consciously in your mind, you're like, I need to stop drinking. I need to stop doing this. I need to stop doing that. Something about that when you're triggered is just giving you that instant relief. Right. Mm-hmm. And so kind of going back into that piece of what you were talking about, I really think that healing within itself is coming into a radical acceptance of every aspect of who you are, even the parts of yourself that you, you try to like not show anyone and like stuff in the closet and stuff like mm-hmm. that. When you really allow it, the, the way that I describe it to my clients is like, think about a Thanksgiving table, you know, and everyone's there, but I'm only really serving the parts of myself that other people like the parts of myself that I think are lovable and stuff like that. But I'm not really 
like looking at the parts of myself that need that same love and yeah. the nurturing and the food on the table and I'm just letting them starve. Like that's what your life looks like. And so I think, you know, healing really is coming into a radical acceptance of every single part of yourself. And I think, you know, what we, what, what I've been seeing for the past two years is that so many people are in resistance to that because they've made a home out of dysregulation. They've, they've made a home out of like, you know, constantly being hypervigilant, you know, all these different things. And so it's like, I talk about that too, where it's like being in that state of resistance keeps you in comfort as well, because mm -hmm. I'm helpless to my circumstances. I'm powerless to my circumstances. And it's like this underlying message of, I'm really waiting for someone to come in and rescue me from this. The same way that I wanted mom and dad to rescue me when I was younger. So, you know, that, that ties back into that piece of like, just um, our attachment wounds and stuff too. Mm -hmm. And I tell my clients all the time, I'm like, I don't mean to sound mean, but like no one is going to rescue you. I, I think out of all people, I should probably say that to you so we can sit here and grieve that together because that that there is sadness that comes yeah. with that. No one's going to rescue me. I have yeah. to do this stuff on my own. And so we cry about it. We get angry about it. But, th but then we get to a point where it's like, okay, we have to come into an acceptance of this so that way we can start to tap into what are, what is my inner strength? What are these mm. tools that I have on the inside that make me unique, that, that, that I have all of these things that I'm looking for in someone else in myself? Yes. Yes. And by the way, that goes for church, parents, <laughs> politics. Like it does not matter who you're looking to, to do that rescuing, right? It's all the same thing. Just call it a different name. It's the same shit, right? Exactly. Oh, God. I mean, like so many moments in what you just said, but I think that's something that we don't speak to or actually even think about mm -hmm. that the devil I know, the home and the dysregulation is a lot of times like that is the thing that's feeding me because I know how to do this and this mm -hmm. feels like good enough, right? Um, and yeah, that pattern interruption is so terrifying because I don't know what that's going to feel like. I don't know exactly. what a better life is or what that could be. Like, I don't know. It could be, I don't know. It's not yeah. Well, and also, that's what you always say, Janae, right? It's that the Marianne Williamson quote around what we really fear, right? And if I, you always say, say it, please say it. Oh, our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate, it's that we're powerful beyond belief. Is that right? You're speaking so about? I think what's so interesting about that, right, is that it's yes, like I it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't. I don't know what an amazing, fulfilled, empowered life could be. So I'm I'm afraid of what I don't know, but also the fall, air quotes, the fall from that can seem so much bigger than the continual fall every day from the low level, the low rungs that I've allowed myself to live on, right? And so this idea of stepping into our power, it's its not just that I'm afraid of what I might be. It's that I'm afraid that that fall, I won't be able to tolerate that fall, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. it's like I, what I see people doing constantly is it's like when I try to explain that concept of them being afraid of like what they might be, I, I get a little bit not resistance. It's like they want to understand it. But when we talk about the fear around what happens if that doesn't work, what happens if that blows up in your face, what happens if you fall from that ladder? That's when I see the physical like uh, that, like mm -hmm. recoil, you know, because falling from one step up, it's not that far. Exactly. Because you, know? you think the fall will kill you, right? You like when you're ex in the midst of anxiety, you think anxiety is going to last forever, right? Like you think what I'm feeling now is how I will always feel. And it could kill me if I allow this to get bigger. And so I've got to do whatever I've been doing to sort of like cope it and keep a lid on it because I don't know what it's going to be if I just yeah. like let go and let it run wild. It could, it could right. destroy me, right? And this yeah. is so much of the depression and anxiety conversations, right, that we have so often, especially in depth psychology, which is like, rather than keep that lid on it, and, you know, Danae, your analogy of like holding the beach ball under the water, like how long is this going to last before it explodes? We're so afraid of that explosion when actually that explosion is the healing, right? And then what comes after is the healing. The keeping the lid on it, that's not healing, and that's what we do in this culture. We keep a fucking lid on it. And so we keep ourselves from the healing, right? We keep ourselves sick. We keep ourselves dependent. We keep ourselves victimized. We keep ourselves, and I, I shouldn't even say we, because we need to obviously look at this as more of like a societal 
thing, right? Yeah. The patriarchy, the structures that be keep us sick. Because if that beach ball exploded, those powers would crumble. Exactly. Exactly. I talk about that in the sense too, I give this example to my clients of like, you know, when I was younger and I was like riding my bike and I fell and I got like this, I remember one time I had this really nasty cut on my knee. It was disgusting. Um, and my dad, I remember he put like some alcohol and, and stuff on it. And then he put like a bandaid over it. And he said to me, he was like, you know, eventually that bandaid is going to get old and you're going to have to take it off or else it's going to get infected. So like mm-hmm. once it's old, like take it off, maybe replace it with like a new one or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then I also remember him saying like, okay, when it starts to heal, like don't wear a bandaid at all. You got to let it get some air, <laughs> you know, like so it can actually heal. And so I, I use that analogy with my clients all the time because the bandaid that we use are all of these coping mechanisms, other people right we try to we try to invite them into our experience to like cover up our insecurity of being rejected or being abandoned not being good enough so you're using all these different band-aids right and so the thing is is that when i when i take off the band-aid because remember that wound is not healed if i've been covering it up the whole time mm-hmm. it's going to bleed out and so so we wonder why we we end up getting into relationships and we're bleeding out on other people you know like their their feelings about them and what they're doing in their life or how they feel about me become how I feel about myself. It's it's like, I, I talk about this too in my content as well. It's like a lot of us have been conditioned to do that. So many mm-hmm. of us have been conditioned to be codependent, using other people as band-aids for the wounds that we're not ready to address. But I always just tell my clients, I'm like, you might as well just rip it off. You know, you might as well just rip it off now. You know, it's, it's going to bleed out. It's going to hurt, you know, but, but it's really understanding that everything that you desire is going to be like outside of your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. Everything that you, you desire is going to be like, once you let that wound get some air. So, so that way it has your attention at that point. But kind of going back to what it is that you were saying, I, I think people have just gone through so much within the past almost three years now, I want to say, I think it's been three years. People have gone through so much that like, it, it kind of goes back to that piece of what you're saying. Like, I'm scared that like, if I fall, I'm scared that like, if this doesn't work out, I won't even be able to have the capacity to deal with it. Mm. So I'm trying to articulate the question that's coming up that I want to ask you, because something that Vanessa and I have been grappling with a little bit or sort of riffing on is that we very much talk about what you're saying. We believe we are a codependent society. It's the air we breathe, everything about from our fairy tales to our ideas of what love and relationships are. It's all codependent. It's not like some of us are codependent. It's we are taught to be codependent pretty Mm -hmm. much, right? And I think what I'm wondering as I'm listening to you is from your perspective, how do we, how do I ask this? Um, how do we stay in the space of doing this individual work, but then coming back into like what relationship is where it is not like I am distracting myself with this person, right? Like what is, how do you sort of support people in the understanding of what that looks like and reframing that if everything that we've taught been taught about what relationships are or sort of um, that we self-regulate through making sure the world around us is okay. Yeah. What does that look like to come back into right relationship with those around us? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So Kehlani actually has this song. She's an R and B artist and it's, it's a song called melt. And she talks mm-hmm. about how, she's so in love and she's melting into the other person. And it's a beautiful song, but when you really think about it, it's just like, oh, this is terrible. That term, <laughs> that term has like, that term has oh, actually a very personal, <laughs> a personal response to me because that is <laughs> literally, like literally the exact term that my partner has said in the past. I want you <laughs> I to melt you into me. And I'm like, ew, <laughs> no, I will not be melting into anyone. <laughs> I literally resonate with your husband's work so much because I'm like that. I'm I'm like the anxious person, right? Like I need to like be in your skin. Like if I could just like crawl into you. I, I want to rip my skin off as you say that. <laughs> Vanessa and I run avoidance. So we're like, really? What you know? Is that what sounds nice to you, Imani? <laughs> it's like, what? Get out of my skin. <laughs> you know what? And you know what is so, you know what's so interesting? When I really started doing some work around that, I also tiptoed over into more like avoidant tendencies Mm. i wouldn't i wouldn't say that i was an avoidant um attachment because i know a lot of the times when it's it's from an insecure place it's like this 
shut down of your emotional yeah. world. Like I'm very more so like logical. So I wasn't yeah. that, but I, but I tended to have like those tendencies when I really started healing until I got to this balance of like being more secure. Right. Um, but what I will say in regards to your questions, I really think that goes into the conversation of really understanding what boundaries are. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the time, and I can say this as someone who has had, had struggled with very anxious tendencies. A lot of the times we view boundaries as barriers. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not, we don't see them as like, oh, this is where I end and where someone else begins. We see it as like, this is rejection. You don't like me. So we, we, we take it very personal. A lot of the times we start talking about boundaries and that's why, you know, I'm really a big fan of Nedra Tawab's work because I love how just mm. clear cut she is when it comes to boundaries. Yep. And I really just like talking about it in a way that is empowering. You know, like I, I always say like boundaries define the essence of who you are. You can't, mm. you can't, you can't melt into someone because then their boundaries become your boundaries. Mm. Their standards become your standards. So, so that whole like melting into someone I think about it like if I were to have two different colors of Play-Doh, like a red and a blue, and then I mish them together. Right? I have a lot of containers of brown Play-Doh yeah. <laughs> because I have a two and a half year old. So I completely get this you analogy get where I'm always like, stop it. Why are you ruining? All, it's all brown. Don't you want pretty play? <laughs> Maybe I got to teach her more about boundaries. <laughs> right. It's like, it's like, so what happens when you take those two different colors and you mush them together. It's going to look like red poop. And blue, they're going to, right. It's going to turn into like this purplish, brownish, whatever <laughs> color. And the thing is, is that even if you were to try to like separate it, it'll never go back to its original color ever Ugh. again. Nope. You with the metaphor. Yes. Girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I figured out. That's what I found out when I was getting into relationships, trauma bonding mm. with people. And you're like, why can't I just leave this person alone? My, my friends used to say that all the time. Like, I don't even know what you see in this guy. Like, why are you so head over heels with them? And it's because there's so many different parts of myself in them because I've yeah. now melted into them. And that's why mm. a trauma bond is one of the hardest things to break out of because I, I use the Play-Doh analogy all the time. Like, you got to do some work to really try to disconnect yourself from that. Not saying that it's not possible. It is, but... Do you think hard. that... This is a question actually I've never really thought about and I don't know the answer. I'm wondering if we can just like pontificate on this a bit. But do you think that one person can be trauma bonded to somebody in a relationship or do you feel like in order for it to be a trauma bond, it has to go both ways? I want to Stumping say, the therapist. I'm like, what I know, right? I'm like, oh, I think it has to go both ways because I think when you are in a trauma bond, the person is, is bringing up things in you that are, that are unconscious to you. Yeah. So, so, so when, when, when we talk about like, um, people, like the universe is your mirror, relationships mm -hmm. are mirrors. And so no one's going to come into your experience for no reason, really. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it kind of taps into like that, that spiritual piece. So there's something within you that is making you a match to this experience. So like, mm -hmm. if you're someone who's avoidant and you're in a relationship with someone who is like, an unintegrated anxious, you know, because I, I think everybody falls on some some right. side of the spectrum, like whatever. It's all survival tactics. It's, it's fine. But um, <laughs> I think if you're you're someone who um, is more so on the avoidant side in your relationship with someone who's more anxious, I think the anxious person is teaching you to be vulnerable, to be more mm -hmm. open with your emotions, to be more expressive. Now, the anxious person may not always get, get it right. The anxious person may tend to kind of like... Uh, dramatize if that's even a word a, a lot of what it is that they're going through and they'll they'll take a lot of whatever narratives that they've created in their head and stories a lot of the times and they'll run with it but i really think that that piece in there is more so of like kind of allowing yourself to open up and be expressive to really share that emotional intimacy with someone and then when an anxious more, when a more anxious person is with an avoidant i think the avoidant them is really teaching them to be self-reliant to be mm -hmm. independent that you you do have those tools inside of you and that when a person is coming into your life they're kind of in addition to what you already have you know it, it's kind of like a cake with some frosting and then you come mm -hmm. into my life and you add some sprinkles right mm -hmm. and, so, and so that those two together that's what we talk about when we talk about moving more towards like kind of like a secure place but going back to your question, I was just saying, this feels like I a good segue say, back to the question, right, right? Right. I think it's, I think it's both. Okay. And then say. going back to Danae's question, this also feels like a good segue back to what you're saying today, because it's like, then, but then where is that line? So what is the, what is the tightrope, I suppose, that we walk between? Okay. You're my mirror. I'm your mirror. Right. Um, because then I feel like we, 
by nature of how we're raised, potentially, we get into the habit of, okay, well, I'm in this relationship, you're teaching me and vice versa, you're my mirror and vice versa. And so now it's kind of my quote unquote job to help heal you to for me to stay in this, right? Because you're quote unquote healing me. And I don't know when that end point is where I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't like this anymore. Like, I don't know if I'm formulating this, but I'm kind of like riffing yeah. off of your question today, which is like, I feel like some of the work that I know, it's even just in myself, but also in a lot of my clients that are grappling with this, I want to move from codependency to more interdependence, right? Is like, but where is that line? Like, at what point do I wave the white flag and say, okay, I don't want to do this anymore? Or I don't know. I don't know if I articulated I that, but it's, I'm, I'm, it's, yeah, it's, that was perfect. it's popcorning perfect. around my head right now. Yeah. The, the way that I'm thinking about it, I feel, I feel it's like, you know, really understanding what your values are and understanding mm. when the relationship no longer aligns with your values. I, I think a lot of the times we don't talk enough about what our values are. We talk about what our needs are, but we, we don't talk about the things that we value because the thing is, is that your values change as you go mm -hmm. through life. The things that I valued at 18 are not the things that I value now at almost 30. So it, it, it's just like, I, I think it's more so of someone is going to come into my experience and they are going to be different from me. Mm. they're going to be different. And so it's kind of like, everybody's going to come with their own insecurities. Everybody's going to come with, with their own stuff. And it more so has to align with your values. Mm. I think we, I, I talk about this all the time. Like we, we all have like deal breakers, right? Red flags and yellow flags and, and green flags and all this stuff like that. And sometimes I try to steer away from those conversations because they tend to be very rigid. Mm -hmm. um, and there's not enough curiosity a lot of the times because I always say, okay, you saw a red flag in this person you know, let's, let's get curious about this. Like, did you talk to them about it? What was said? What came up? You know, Usually know. Like, right, right. <laughs> right. It's like, oh, I see this one thing. And it's like, yeah. it reminds me of the past. No. Right. And, and, and I think a lot of the times what ends up happening is we isolate ourselves from relationships in general, not really understanding the nuances of relationships, which is you both are perfectly flawed, both of you. Right. And, and so it's like, my differences may not be compatible with the next person's differences. And maybe it's just so polarizing that like we can't even coexist together. But however, like I'll use the relationship that I'm in now. My partner is different from me. He does things different from me. Sometimes can they be pretty annoying? Yeah. But are they things that I'm like, that's just him and I love and accept him for those things? Yeah. You know, so, so I'm not, I'm not walking around with kind of just like, I'm constantly ruminating in my head, like, oh, is this a relationship for me? Should I leave? Should I go? Like all these different things. And so it, it kind of goes back to what are the things that I value in my life? And the person that I'm sharing this experience with, do they value similar things? Mm -hmm. And do I know, it, it kind of goes back to what I was mentioning before about that boundaries piece of where I end and where mm -hmm. the other person begins. And just because we have differences, it doesn't mean that we are not um, compatible. It doesn't mean that we can't be with each other. But I think this is why it's so important for us to really tap into our own authenticity because no one can tell us if a relationship is the right fit for us or not. That That's an inside job. And and so once again, codependent society, you're waiting for someone else to tell you if you should be in that relationship or not, rather than being able to kind of like open yourself up and just feel into, okay, I think I want to do life with this person. I think I think I've seen as, as bad as it can get, <laughs> you know, and granted, mm -hmm. You have it. You know, you still got life to do with this person. <laughs> you have it. <laughs> you have it. It'll get worse. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, am I, am I willing to go on that ride? Yeah, am, yeah. am I, am I, am I willing to have that experience and just be able to ground myself in what feels authentic to me and, and what is my values in regards to this relationship? So I hope that yeah. that. I'm obsessed with what mm -hmm. you just said. I like was <laughs> making some notes because there's something so profound to me about holding our relationships with the question, is this still in alignment with my values? Mm -hmm. And something you said, V, that like, I think is another part of where we get in the sticky of codependency for me is that I am somehow responsible for another person's healing. And I think if we see each relationship with everyone, not just our romantic relationships, but as a mirror to like what I am meant to understand about myself, then that person, 
you know, to me, sovereignty is you are entitled to the dignity of whatever you are meant to experience in your own healing. That's not for me to say, mm-hmm. to do for you, to swoop like, in. That's your work. That's yeah. your divine assignment, like real talk, right? And so when I get in the space of like, I need to like attempt to heal you, that's like, that's where we're in codependency. That's yeah. where I, but if we're sort of like, are we on the same page with like what we are working towards Mm -hmm. alignment with our values? That's a very different conversation. And I think it can be for like, for as long as it's meant to, you know, something John brought into my world that I think is so helpful is just the idea that sometimes relationships are meant to expire. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that at one point we weren't in alignment with Mm -hmm. one another's values, but sometimes we aren't anymore. We're going in different directions. And then neither person is necessarily wrong. Right. Yeah. It's just such a different way of holding. Thank you for that. Yeah. 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 Because I, I think a lot of the times we demonize people and villainize them for like having differences and it's like, yeah, no, it's, <laughs> they're just different, you know, but, but that's, that's the other thing too. I, I talk about this as well, where it's like, when you tend to be more of like on the insecure side of like your attachments and stuff like that, you're taking everything personally. Right. Mm-hmm. And so once you can move more to that secure place, you meet someone, you know, maybe the values aligned and maybe two years later, it's like, whoa, okay. Like now this is completely different than what I wanted for myself. Um, and so, so you're able to kind of say, okay, you know what? It's not that this person is bad or evil, but it's more so that we just have different values. And I, and I love them enough to yep. let them go align with someone else who can meet them where they're at right now. And I also love myself enough to give myself that experience as well. And then I would say what, like the tangibility of like when you're in relationship and you have those moments of disconnection, of rub, of because, comp- you know, it's, it'll happen no matter what in any relationship. I guess the practice the self practice is just continuing to get still, acknowledge what's coming up for you, and then essentially offer it, not Danae as a way to say like, oh, we're going to fix each other, right? Like we're going to heal each other's wounding, but to say like, here's what's coming up for me. Here's what, you know, my experience is, you know, the story I'm telling myself is all of these things. And then allow the other person to show up how they're going to show up. But neither of you are necessarily responsible for fixing the other person, soothing the other person, um, even necessarily fixing what's quote unquote wrong in that moment. I also think that's like a really bad habit that we have is like, there's something wrong. I have to fix it. Right. It, not even the person, just it, whatever it is. Um, and that in and of itself is a codependent way of looking at relationships. Right. right. If I were to say, okay, there is a, there's a rupture right now. Here's my piece. You get to come and say, here's your piece. That rupture might not necessarily be fixed, but can that be okay? Can it be more okay or more healing for both of us to actually just see and hear and witness each other in that space, period, and have that be enough, right? Um, Because I do think we get way too caught up in having to constantly be fixing ruptures, and I'm speaking mm-hmm. for myself on this one too, um, that we miss the actual healing opportunity, which is just simply to show up in the rupture and say, here's what's happening for me. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And I think that also contributes to, you know, just our society, that microwave society, everything is so tangible for yeah, us now. Yeah. And so that even, you know, translates into our relationships and needing the other person to get it right away, yes. needing them to process things as fast as we process things. Mm-hmm. And I had to also... um learn that in my relationship too, that my partner is going to process things differently than I do. doesn't mean that we don't ever revisit the conversation. We never Mm -hmm. talk about it again, but it's more so like I honor your process and finding your way on your own. Mm. My only responsibility is to present something to you. You know, we talk about it when we need to, but then we also need to take that, that step away because you got to come back home to yourself, sort out the information and then say, okay, this works for me. This is not what works for me. So then I'm able to come back and be able to talk about that a little bit more openly. But I think a lot of the times coming into this work, what I see a lot of people doing, and I'm going to say professionals, mm. is teaching people how to be rigid. Mm-hmm. And we have to understand that it, it, it's more so about flex flexibility. The same thing with boundaries. Like you don't mm-hmm. want your boundaries to be too loose. You don't want them to be too rigid. You want them to be flexible. So you want people to understand the nuances that come with relationships and that mm-hmm. everything isn't a red flag. Everything isn't a deal breaker. And now we can't be together anymore. Yep. But more so like this is an opportunity for you to do some soul searching within you to, to really figure out, okay, what is this experience trying to 
teach me with this person? Is it telling me that I need to be with someone else? Is yeah. it telling me that there maybe are some parts that this person is mirroring to me that maybe I need to come into more compassion about, more understanding, less less judgment? So there's so much to, to work with there. And I think when we can teach our clients more so of like, that flexibility, it makes it mm -hmm. easier. But you're not going to be able to teach that if you haven't even come into it with yourself. Well, love, hate with social media. Again, the hate mm -hmm. side is that you there, you can't have nuance in a 10 slide <laughs> infographic. Right. You can't. Right. It's literally not possible to capture human nuance. And so I do think to your point, professionals, like we are part, you know, like I think the idea, I think the motivation is good. I think Absolutely. mostly we're out there to do good. But it's impossible. You can't have human nuance captured in an Instagram post. And um, exactly. I think that's the tricky. That's the tricky part of what we do being kind of out in the social media world. As, yeah, as people come in my comments all the time. They all the yeah. time. Like, oh, yeah. This is this is a yeah. victim blaming post. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I get that a lot. Oh <laughs> the victim yeah. blaming. Get that one. Yeah, I made a post a, a couple of weeks ago. I literally had to like turn off the comments. It was getting like so insane. But I was talking about, I was looking at my analytics and I noticed that when I talk about codependency, trauma bonds, toxic relationships, mm -hmm. it's like viral, yep. right? But then when I start talking about like, okay, this is how we talk about setting boundaries and really getting to know yourself and like holding yourself accountable. It's like crickets. And so I turned that into a post <laughs> yep. and then people are like, oh, because we want to find out what's wrong. We want to pick, pick, pick. What's wrong with that person? How can I blame them? Meh, meh, meh. Like that is yeah, just so our like, go-to. Right. They're like, you, Not me? Take been. personal responsibility? Right. I don't want to read it's about that shit. Oh, and I was selling my book. My pub <laughs> Not my publisher, but publishers were like, yeah, people don't really want to talk about personal responsibility. I was mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know what we're going to talk about. Then. Right. Like, where, where do we <laughs> so where do like, I go right? from here? <laughs> what, what are we doing here, people? But that's I think because, that's yeah, that's because people are more interested in, in the aesthetic of healing. Yeah. yeah. Not, not actually Ooh. doing the work. And so when, when I'm talking Oof. about yep. trauma bonds and toxic yeah. relationships, and it's all about what the other person is doing that is so bad to me, that feels better than me having to actually take accountability for oh, myself yeah. and... You practice dropped, boundaries and stuff. You drop so many like phrases. The aesthetic of healing. Yep. <laughs> it's so <laughs> beautiful. But I think that's real, you know, and I think with what you guys were saying before, something that Mark Groves says that you reminded me of, V, is that like if we're not in relationship with ourselves enough to know our truth, then we can't communicate that truth to the other person. We will avoid those truths in order to maintain the relationship. And that is where self-abandonment lies. But mm -hmm. we got to go inward and take personal responsibility first. And I think that is the piece of the aesthetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've like literally written down like five little phrases. Little yeah. nuggets. Yeah. The Imani stealing. nuggets. <laughs> stealing Imani nuggets. <laughs> take them all. Take them all. Oh, I love, so I love, good. I love this stuff. And I just, I just love this work because so much of what I've read, so much of what I've learned in school, learned in my own personal experiences, I can just offer it, you know, mm -hmm. like, all right, this yeah. could be helpful for to you. Like you either take it or you don't. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's, it's like, especially on social media, kind of going back into that, it's just people, I see it all the time. Content creators are like, Hey, this is not therapy. Like, don't take this and like try to apply it to your life. And this is just like your only medicine. And people mm -hmm. still find ways to like, all that. Just not, yeah, yeah, just not, just not even look at that and just go into what they saw in the message that is triggering them. And I made a post about that too, where I was like, you know, a lot of the times when you're seeing something from a content creator and it's triggering you, you're being called to turn within. Like, it's not really necessarily them, but it's, like, it's something inside of you, right? Yeah. It's something yeah. inside of you. So I think, um, just a lot of people really, really struggle with that because I know I, I don't feel compelled to write like a thesis under someone's post about why I disagree I don't with either. them. It's kind of just like, just keep me scrolling. I don't either. <laughs> That's so it. funny. John doesn't even read his comments. It's so, <laughs> like, John, you should read some of them. He's like, I don't have time. I'm like, well, uh, okay. Well, sometimes I do. <laughs> sometimes I'll go into his post and I'll respond to <laughs> some like, Let me see what he's saying. <laughs> it's, it's overwhelming it's, it's it is over it can be overwhelming, overwhelming. and then somebody doesn't yeah. care right it's just that it's overwhelming i mean you got to remember when yeah. somebody has at that point to like three hundred thousand. it's like how do you yeah. respond you can't i mean it's it, yeah. that would in itself would be a full-time job right exactly yeah exactly well well i feel like we could drink up these money nuggets the money for nuggets. like the rest <laughs> of the day but we want to be mindful of your time um so we have a lightning round of questions that we ask all of our guests um 
And the first question I want to ask is, who have been your greatest teachers, mentors, people who have impacted your journey up to this point, whether they're people you know or just their work has really influenced you? Yeah, so definitely my mom, my family, everyone in total has influenced into my story. So I got to shout them out. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gabor Mate, I've learned so mm -hmm. much from his work. I've learned so much work from Dr. Nicole Lepara as well. Um, I've learned so much by like spiritual teachers as well, Teal Swan. Um, mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of like like any others. I think Man, I had like, heard Teal Swan called out in a while and I appreciate that I one. Know, that's, a, that's an OG. I know. <laughs> I know. There's, there's a lot, but I have learned a lot from her too. Yeah, no, she's um, amazing. Yeah, so those are pretty much the people that I've, I've really, really taken the time to, to really learn from. And um, yeah, that's who I would say are my models in regards to this work. Um, so this idea of flow, right? This flow state, what are, what are you doing when you can kind of like blink your eyes and six hours goes by? Sleeping. Oh, yes. A woman of my own heart. <laughs> are you're you the a first, too? You're the first I'm person. Cancer. Okay. Oh, she's a cancer. Oh, oh, interesting. This is a whole other podcast. I know. You're <laughs> the first person that's ever said that. And that was like such a, I felt that in my soul. What do you say? <laughs> Yes. He's yeah. Like, because you. I think, I think it's not an, I think we don't talk about it enough as mm. healers and, and, and space holders. Like yeah. this, 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 this stuff can be very draining. Yes. It's so fulfilling, but you know, like you, you need kind of like that reciprocation. So yes, like yes. I see my clients, I'm able to give to them, hold space to them, but I got to pour into my own cup as well, you know? And so like sleeping is definitely something that I do playing with my dog you know, going outside, just being one, like with nature, you know, all these different things. Like that's what I like to do in regards to just being in flow. And, and of course, also I'm a writer. I journal a lot. I make a whole bunch of posts on Twitter and Instagram mm -hmm. and stuff like that too. And so me coming back to myself a lot of the times has to, it, I, I jump between kind of like resting and being still mm -hmm. and then also writing, you know, so that way I'm able, cause I, I, I notice like when I am in that solitude, a lot of the times I'm, I'm able to get the messages. And so yes. that way I'm able to translate it over into my writing and, and put it out there. Yeah. And what breaks your heart, Imani? What breaks my heart? Wow, I haven't been asked that question before. I'm trying to think. People who are stuck. Mm -hmm. People who are stuck. And it's not that they don't want to do this work, but that they don't know how. Um, and yeah. so it, it's, it's kind of like, it's better for me to just stay in, you know, this, this bubble that I call my personality, which is really a mix of like the coping mechanisms and the authenticity than it is to even like turn within. Um, my heart breaks for people who don't have the support because I remember times where I felt like I didn't really have support. It breaks my heart when people and when I say people I'm also talking about parts of myself too um don't speak up for themselves mm -hmm. um or find it very threatening to speak up for themselves um and I would say those are those are the things that that break my heart the most yeah mm. okay and the last question which I, I I already know I feel like we're we're kindred spirits <laughs> with the sleep comment I'm like it's already there <laughs> what is your favorite food mac and cheese Yes! No I way. told you! Did I not tell you today <laughs> that I knew? <laughs> that just freaked me out a little bit. I'm not going to lie. That was one of those moments of synchronicity. You know what V's favorite food is, right? I love uh, mac and cheese. That just blew my mind a little bit. As that came out of your mouth, I was like, no, she did it! <laughs> You that have to. So funny. You have to have Taurus in your chart. You have to. <laughs> we like Maybe need to do another podcast episode where we like do chart. I might. Comparisons. I literally just might. I, I was just. Mind. Um. I was doing like some some account information because I'm going to be on Alma in a couple of weeks, like the virtual therapy sessions and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And for the security questions, they're like, "Oh, what's your favorite food?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, like I like mac and cheese." So it was ironic that you even asked that because I was like, "Oh yeah, I just said that the other day, mac and cheese." That's but so I funny because I was like, there's something in me that tells me if sleep is your flow, that mac and cheese must also be your food. You were like meant to collide. Yeah. Oh, shit. That's hilarious. I always say Beautiful. that if it was socially acceptable, I would bathe in a vat of mac, like a bathtub of mac and cheese. Like it is. Yeah. 
That's it. That's it for every <laughs> meal know. for the rest of my life. Amazing. I love <laughs> mac and cheese. I love, love, love mac and cheese. There's, there used to be this spot <sighs> like 20 minutes away from me that had different types of like mac and cheese, like a chicken one and like a peso one and all these different things. And I would literally just go crazy. I would go there like every day. They're like, my, New Yorkers, <laughs> my New Yorkers will remember there was a place on the Lower East Side, East Village actually, um, called Smack for a while oh, <gasps> i don't think it's there anymore it was there the whole time oh. i lived in new york and it was just like it was like a broke young kid's dream because it was fairly cheap they had everything right they had like the indian flavor with like the curry and this Ooh. and that and then they had the buffalo chicken flavor and then they had the this and it was all these different kinds and we used to go there my friends and i used to go there constantly um yes. and they would they would come out to you in a skillet oh yes that's exactly how the mac and Mel place was yeah I need to have mac and cheese. All now. right. I'm so hungry. Well, Today's like, all right, I'm done. <laughs> like, you two talk about mac and cheese for a couple hours. But um, Imani, when you come to LA or next time we're in New York, we have to get together for you yes. two to have some mac and cheese. <laughs> we'll get you some vegan mac and cheese today. Don't worry. Uh, I'll, I'll bring my own mac and cheese. Bring so your you own. You can really get down. Bring some from Sage. Uh, yes. It'll be great. Yes. Right. Amazing. Right. Well, Imani, tell, tell our listeners where they can find you, where they can connect with you, all that stuff. Yeah. So my, my Instagram page is Imani in touch. I M A N I I N T O U C H. That's my Instagram page. Also Twitter, same thing, Imani in touch. You can also go on my website, www.imaniintouch.com. I also do group courses. I also do, I have a membership where I offer monthly classes as well. And I also do one to one therapy as well as one to one coaching as well. So I offer both. So you can find all that stuff on my website and you can find all that stuff on my, on my Instagram too. Amazing. I'm just smiling so big. Imani, you know, you are such a bright light and so brilliant. And I, I was thinking as you were talking so many times, I'm so excited for this next generation of healers and people in the mental health field. And like you and the way that you're showing yep, up are just such a beautiful it. integration of soul and like the tangible tools of this work. Thank you for the way you're showing up. I'm delighted to meet you. And yes. for real, mac and cheese party. <laughs> mac and cheese and then a sleepover. <laughs> right. I'll I'll be just sleep. My whole pan. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Bring my pillow. That is my dream. I love it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank Such a so pleasure, Imani. Awesome. Thank you.